How's everyone doing? Great, good. Anybody not doing great? Anybody have something they want to talk about that's really bothering them? <laughs> I know for some of us the answer is yes, but probably this isn't the place to do it. Um, but we will certainly pray for you, and I pray this message will bless you. We're we'll talking about, oh, just want to encourage the guys here, man. We got the men's retreat coming up in uh, two weeks. And uh, yeah, you won't want to miss it. It's a life-changing thing. You, God always shows up in a special way. Same thing with the women's ministry. Anytime people get together to be with God, God does something special. So I, I don't want you to miss that. And if there's some issues uh, financially, um, you know, we, we will help you with that uh, because it's important enough to us to have you go that uh, we, we'll help in any way we can. I want to talk to you guys today about Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it's church, so Jesus is a good thing to talk about. <laughs> but uh, following Jesus is serious business. It's serious business. It has been pointed out that we only divide over people and things that we take seriously. If we don't take it seriously, we don't really you know, care, whatever. Make, it, make a decision, it's not a big deal. And there is good reason why they don't bring up or they say to not bring up religion or politics in family gatherings. Why? Because someone or sometimes everyone takes those issues real serious and that can become uh, problematic. On the other hand, if we don't take things seriously, who cares? For instance, there would be no debate over abortion, sex, the environment, religion, politics, if no one took it seriously. And there would be no division over Jesus if no one took him seriously. Had not the crowds, the prostitutes, the sinners, the demon-possessed, and the diseased taken Jesus seriously, there would have been no division between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. You know that? If he would have just gone with the way they did religion, there would have been no problem. But he went and divided by ministering to the misfits, the marginalized, the troubled, the deeply troubled. And so in that, it caused division. And he was so serious about it that these guys were not going to sway him to go their way. So today is about Jesus telling his disciples, you need to understand how serious it is for you to follow me. And the reason he's sharing this is he's uh, on the last year of his ministry before he goes to the cross and the antagonism between the religious leaders who are now slowly drawn in the Roman government against him the antagonism between that and Jesus was rising and it was gaining momentum. And not only now were they messing with Jesus, they were messing with his disciples who were following Jesus. So Jesus spends a big chunk of chapter 12 in the Gospel of Luke comforting his disciples. He tries to tell them that it's okay, this is going to happen. He says, and, and in the beginning part, he, he chastises the religious leader and says, you guys have nothing to do with me. You have no part of my kingdom. You have no part of me. And then he comforts his disciples and he tells them things like it tells us in the first four verses. He says, dear friends, in Luke 12, he says, dear friends, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more harm to you after that. That's about as little comforting as you can get. <laughs> it says, don't be afraid if someone's going to take your life because you follow me. Well, okay. Because why? Because after that, they can do nothing more. You know, I already got that part. I get it. Once I'm dead, you can't hurt me no more. But it's all the way up to that point that's a little uncomfortable. And so he tells them, then he tells them in verse 32, so don't be afraid, little flock. He calls them a little flock. It's like, why don't you say, like, don't be afraid, roaring lions? 
You're going to tear them up because vengeance is sweet. He says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Why are you worried about this kingdom, he says? This is not where I'm going. Your job is to follow me, and it's serious because it can be costly. You have to make decisions because people will try to sway you. People will try to pull you from where God has you and also what God is doing in you. You know, oftentimes we think if everything was cool out there, I'd be cool in here. God, that's not the way. See, for a lot of us, following Jesus is like he's taking me somewhere. You know where he usually takes you? Into your heart. He says, follow me into this damaged area. Follow me into this traumatized part. Follow me into these issues that have been in your life since you were little. Follow me there. So I can heal and cleanse so you're not operating out of your emotions all the time. Because I don't know if you know this, but trauma causes us to get locked into an emotional position. And usually that emotional position is fight or flight. Everything is I'm being attacked somehow. And so I get into this fight or flight. I respond or react emotionally, and logic has a hard time getting there. And so healing brings us back up to emotional balance, which allows us to also use logic. Is this what's really going on? Rather than how I perceive it. So he says, listen, you have to follow me, and people are going to be a problem sometimes. It's like, that's not news to anybody, is it? And how many know that you're the problem of, the peop- of the, all the people in your life? You're the biggest problem in your life. You is the people. He says, listen. And that's what he's going to talk about today. And it's really, you're going to have problems with people. But you know who you're, most peop- you know you're going to have the biggest problems with? What kind of people? Family. How many have ever had that kind of issue going on? Family issues. He goes, they're not going to be for you doing what I'm calling you. Some of them won't. Why? Because they don't have the same relationship with Jesus that you do. In fact, how many of us have had people tell us that if you follow Jesus, that's like a crutch. That's like an affliction. That's like you're weak. It's a problem. What are you doing? That's not the way to go. And they, you, you have to deal with that. And it's like they don't have the same relationship. And so they will base it on their way of looking at life. Let me tell you a story. There's a guy named uh, Andrew Greeley. He's a best-selling novelist. He's wrote, written a number of books. Um, and he's also a Catholic priest. And he tells this story about a young man. And he says, at the end of a summer vacation, a young man called his mother and father and brothers and sisters together after a day at the beach. There was something important he wanted to tell them. He was going into his third year at Ohio State University. Okay, so let's get the picture. This guy, third year at Ohio State University, comes home, hanging with the family. You know, life is going on. He's he's accomplishing what he needs to accomplish. And he says, and they've been at the beach. They come back from the beach, and he says, hey, everybody, I want to sit down and tell you something really important. A little bit more about him. His grades were wonderful. He was charming, and he was popular, and he was a great student, and and he was successful. Everyone expected in his family he would do important things in life. His father was a medical doctor, and from the day his eldest son was born, he assumed that the boy would follow him into the profession. There had never been any discussion on the matter. It had just been presented over and over that this boy's path was being set by his parents. No discussion was necessary. It was taken for granted. So what was the important subject the young man wanted to talk about? 
He had the crazy idea he wanted to be a minister. In fact, he told his family he would be starting his studies at seminary in September. Hey, I'm not going back to Ohio State University. I'm going to go to seminary. That moment was met with dead silence. Then his father said, no son of his was ever going to be a minister. He had no respect for religion. And if his son wanted to be a minister, then he would no longer be his son. And then the father stormed out of the room, and he left everyone in silence. His mother, after a couple of minutes, turned to him and said, you have ruined our family. You would have thought this guy wanted to be a murderer. He felt he had a call from God to do something, and his family came in and started pulling him in a direction that was different than that. Not because they hated him, but because they didn't know the Jesus he knew. They didn't have the experience with God he had. I remember Teresa's dad telling me, back in, way back in the day when I went into the mission at 89 to be the chaplain over there and uh, telling me, why don't you get a real job and take care of my wife, my daughter. <laughs> it was my wife, that'd be weird, but uh, <laughs> really weird. Um, he said, why don't you get a real job and provide for my daughter? And it was like, I mean, those words pierced, but he didn't know Jesus the way I knew Jesus. He didn't know Jesus the way Teresa knew Jesus. So we have a choice. We have a choice to make with following Jesus. And I see it regularly in, in our church where individuals who, you know, single people, who find someone that, yeah, they love Jesus, they love Jesus, but they find someone, boyfriend, a girlfriend, and all of a sudden, I don't see them for a while. And then they come back, and they've moved in with whoever it was. And, and they're, doing, you know, they're doing this stuff. And it's like, well, why are you doing that? Well, I love this person. I understand you might love them, but what happened to Jesus? See, what tends to take place is we have to make decisions between people-pleasing and God-pleasing. And not only is it uncomfortable for others, it's uncomfortable for us. How many have ever been uncomfortable in what Jesus wants you to do? How many are uncomfortable with what Jesus sometimes puts you through? How many know that it goes way beyond uncomfortable? There is that dynamic in us that following Jesus causes division. And Jesus is going to talk mainly in this passage to his disciples saying, not only are these religious people going to mess with you, your own family is going to misunderstand what's going on. Not all of them, but some of them. Things are going to change. It's a cost to follow me. And this is the deal. It's simply about following me. Your allegiance has to be to me. Or if it isn't, things will pull you away. It wasn't long ago I was just talking to a person um, and they were asking me, Joe, how, how do you still trust God? She knew, our, she knew our story, but there's way more story than the, the recent story or more recent story. How, how, how do you explain trust to me? Because I don't get trust, and people can have different ideas of trust. What is your idea of trusting God? What does that mean? I said, This is what it means to me. Trusting God is knowing that He will do what His Word says, He will do it. Whether I see it, whether I've experienced it yet, is irrelevant to me, it's not an important thing. What is important is that he said he would do it. And if he says he's going to work all things out for good, you mean he's going to work the bad things out? Yeah, he's going to work them. What about my mistakes? Is he going to work that out for good? Yeah, he'll work that out for good for those who are called by him and love him. Those that have a relationship with him. 
I said, that's what trust is to me, come hell or high water. It's, it's I trust that he's going to do what he says. He will bring justice. Things are so unjust. Why does God allow injustice? He will bring justice someday. I just don't know when. Well, why is this happening? Why is God letting me go through this? He's doing something in you. He's doing a work that will prove to be good. Stay the course. That's trusting Jesus. Keep following. And he's telling his disciples this because he's, and then he's going to use himself as an example. So after he starts off this journey of comforting them for 45 verses, that it's going to be okay, it's going to be worked out, even though these people are come against you, even though it may cost you your life, it's okay. That's a hard thing to swallow. It's going to be okay. But nonetheless, do I believe what he says? And so, he says this in verse 49. He says, listen, I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish it were already burning. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me. Now, the guys, his disciples, the men and the women, they don't understand all that. They don't understand anything about the cross. They keep because of their thinking, and Peter especially, keeps trying to draw Jesus away from that. He says, listen, I have a terrible uh, a baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I am under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. What is he talking about? He says, listen, I've come to set the world on fire. This cross that I'm going to, it's kindling. It's going to burn, and I'm going to be on it. And that will start a fire. The next fire after that will be my resurrection, which will change your relationship with me, life after life. And then the next fire will be the fire of the Holy Spirit coming on Pentecost, which is Pentecost Sunday, I believe, today. He says this fire will catch people on fire, and they will want to follow me. They will want to be with me. And it will also be repulsive to others who will hate that fire, who will come against that fire, who want nothing to do with it. So he says, I didn't come to bring peace. And he'll say that in the next couple of verses. I came to set a course that will be a fire-led course. And I have this burden on me. You know, every time Jesus mentions in the scripture his crucifixion or alludes to it, he calls it a burden. He calls it a trial. He calls it, in this sense, a baptism. I will be fully immersed into this suffering. He says, it messes with me all the time. While I'm doing all these things, for the Lord, this, fi this burden weighs me down. Now, the difference between him and us is he knows the end of his game. He knows where he is heading, and he says it's a terrible ending, and it crushes me when I think about it. it crushes me. But nonetheless, I follow the will of my Father who gave this to me, and I am walking it out, whether the religious leaders are for it, whether these people follow, whether they don't follow. Listen, you need to understand this, that it's serious business. It doesn't mean there isn't joy. It doesn't mean there isn't peace and happiness. It means there's going to cause, I have to leave some things. I have to make hard decisions of whether I go with people-pleasing or whether I go with the Lord or whether I go with Joe-pleasing. There's, there's, there's choices I will have to make numerous times. What am I going to do in this situation? And not only is it out there like Jesus was talking about the cross, it's the burden he had to carry inside that he was following his father inside, and it was hard it was, it was brutal for him to carry it. 
But nonetheless, that was God's will for him in that area. And so what's he going to do? He had opportunity. The devil tried to get him to bail out. Hey, listen, if you come follow me, I'll give you everything in the world. You don't, you don't have to go through this. You don't have to do this kind of stuff. Then he goes on to say this in verse 49. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's, uh, let's go back a second. After he says, I have a terrible suffering, I want to talk about that a little bit more because in John 12, 27, he says this to his disciples in another passage. I, my soul, my innermost being is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. I came to accomplish this. And it's going to cost me because it's serious business. When we begin to realize in our lives that following Jesus is serious business. Why? Because we want to make it light business. We want to make it easy business. We want it to flow well. We want God to bring us much pleasure and very little problems. And so some of you in here have to deal with an illness ongoing. Some of you have to deal with continual loneliness. And when is God going to relieve that? And see, voices will come to cause us to compromise that. You don't need to be lonely. You don't need to wait. How many problems waiting on God to do stuff? How many? T uh, no, you can raise your hand because I know you do. I see enough of you in my office. <laughs> you know, how many of us have problems with patience? Well, God's going to bring. How many of us have enemies? What does God say? Love your enemies. So he ain't going to take them all away. He's going to teach you how to love them. Love them? I don't even like them. So listen, Jesus experienced problems with his family too. In fact, when he was eight days old, his mom and dad took him to the temple to be circumcised and to be offered up to God as the oldest son. He would belong to the Lord. Lord's call on him was what was important. We give you our first fruit. You get to choose what you want to do with this child. And then as Simeon is blessing this child, he sees something. He says, whoa, this child is going to cause division. He's going to lift up people while also causing other people to stumble. Then he looks at Mary and he goes, your heart is going to be pierced because of this boy. You will not understand. You will have a broken heart. You will be wounded deeply in your heart. Have a good day. Uh, the baptism's over. <laughs> Why? Because she won't understand. Our first glimpse of that in Scripture is in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 2 also where Jesus is 12 years old. He goes with his family to the temple in Jerusalem because it was the feast of Passover. And his parents leave and he's left there for three days. I don't know how he hid from them or, you know, what went on, but they couldn't find him for three days. And he is spending time in the temple talking to these religious leaders. And Scripture says they're, they're amazed at his knowledge at 12 years old of the deep understanding he had of God's word. But he's never even been to seminary. He's never been to nothing. And so when his parents finally found him, they went up to him and they said, uh, you know, why have you done this to us? Why did you split? Why, what is going on? We're petrified. You're a teen boy and you're, you're out here. Man, it's dangerous. And he says to them this in verse 49, why were you searching for me? Because you're 12 years old. <laughs> Hello. Out here in the wilderness, out here in Jerusalem. What do you mean, why are we searching for you? Teens, I hate teens. <laughs> he asked, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Didn't you know I was supposed to be about this will, even as a young child? 
And he says, didn't you know? Which means they should have known. What is the disconnect? These are the same parents that saw the miracles of the Immaculate Conception, that saw the wise men come and bring gifts, that saw shepherds come and worship, that saw, you know, angels. I mean, they've, they've talked to angels. They've seen a, a bunch of stuff that God has done. But even with all of that, they still didn't get all that Jesus is about and what's he doing. And then later on when Jesus is in his ministry, in Mark 3.10, it says, one time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again. And this was early on in his ministry and the religious leaders were already beginning to have a little problem with this guy. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. There were so many people. When his family heard what was going on, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. When they got word back to Nazareth that Jesus is doing incredible things and he's making a lot of people mad, they said, oh my gosh, he's out of his mind. We gotta get him into a place and get him some Xanax or something. This guy is losing and maybe some psychotropic drugs. I don't know, this guy needs help. And they went to get him. And in verse 31, it says, then Jesus' mother's mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. They didn't go in. They didn't fight through. Why? Because when he came out, his bros were going to jump him. And they were taking him back home, straighten him out. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? We just told you they're outside. <laughs> That's the scripture. I don't know. I look at it that way. It's like... Then he looked at those around him and said, look, these are my brothers. Or are my mother and my brothers. And anyone who does God's will, anyone who follows me, is my brother and sister and mother. He goes, there's two families, blood family. And then there's the family that belongs to the kingdom. And at some point... If you're walking in the kingdom, you will have to draw distinction between family members. There will be times where your family isn't on board with your decision to walk with the Lord and to go where God's taking you. And there are times when you're not even on board with it. Here's one more with Jesus. After this, in John 7, 1, it says, after this, Jesus traveled around Galilee, so he's up north, he wanted to stay out of Judea, down south, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. So he's up in Galilee. There's a feast of tabernacles happening, and everybody's supposed to go to south in Judea to Jerusalem, which is in the south and located in Ju the, the province of Judea. And he decides, I'm not going there because they're, they're trying to kill me down there, and it's not my time yet. Again... People are doing things, but he's making a choice to step from that and stay on the path he needs to stay on. And it says, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters, and Jesus' brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide up here in this little pokey town. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers didn't believe in him, his own family. People, this is how messed up his brothers are. And some of us have friends like this too. And they're trying to do the right thing. People are trying to kill him over here. And his brothers are going, you know where you should go? Over there. That'll be good for you. Because it's in Jerusalem and you want to be a celebrity apparently. You need to take your dog and pony show over there and show everybody what you can do and you'll get super popular. They would rather him be harmed. Not thinking that's going to happen, but thinking, oh, bro wants to be popular. He wants to be the celebrity in the family. He wants, and none of us have ever experienced any of that kind of talk from someone in our family. Oh, you're Mr. Big Shot. 
Oh, Mr. Judgmental. You're, you know, you're going to follow Jesus? Oh, okay. You're one of them people. And I, we have been that way. You know, I, years ago, I told people in public, you know, when we get around people, please don't call me Pastor Joe because it creates an energy that is not good for me. All of a sudden, it's like, you may as well tell them I sell used cars. <laughs> may as well tell them I sell insurance. I said, immediately, the temperature changes and people start looking at me. Oh, and then the conversation changes. Hey, I, I, I've gone to church. Um, <laughs> I haven't gone lately. Um, I don't drink that much. Um, and, I mean, this, the whole game, I said, man, just call me Joe. Just call me Joe because it changes, it changes the dynamic. Now I, I don't really care. It, you think that's weird. You should go to a punk rock concert and get called Pastor Joe. That's a, that's a real weird dynamic. You have the people that go, why would a pastor come to something like this? And the other people thinking, oh, this, that, man, that guy just ruined my high. And... Uh, It gets weird, uh, but it really gets weird when it's in your own family, and you're coming in there. And uh, you know what? For me, invariably, when I go out with people and it comes time to pray for the food, Joe, you want to pray? Because people have this distorted view. Like when I pray, Jesus is going, oh, Joe's praying. <laughs> I'm all ears to Joe, as opposed to he's all ears to you, too. He's all, but we have this thing, and I tell people now, I just tell them, man, I'm off the clock right now. <laughs> I'd like to hear somebody else pray for this food, because I pray for it to bless it, but it's Mexican food, and I'm pretty sure it ain't. It ain't going to bless my body. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Enough about me. Let's talk about Jesus. Then Jesus... His own family didn't get it. And Jesus is going to tell his disciples, your families aren't going to get it either. Not everyone, but some people in your family just don't understand. And he says, that's okay. Stay the course. Stay the course. In fact, in verse, 12, verse 51 of chapter 12 of Luke, he says this. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Do you think I came to make everything nice? No, I tell you, but division. It's going to cause problems for you to follow me. Remember the, tech, the context. His disciples are feeling persecuted from the religious leaders. They're seeing Jesus get it day in and day out, and the animosity and the hate is building, and the Romans are being drawn into this, the government, and there is all this stuff going on, and they're now feeling this stuff. And he's saying, listen, this is the way it's going to be. When you follow me, there's a path I'm on, and it's not going to be what other people would follow. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. And then he says this, from now on, families will be split apart. Not in the sense of they love you. Split apart, no, well, sometimes. But they will be split apart, he says, in this way, three in favor of me and two against. Or two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And that's not uncommon, that one. Um, <laughs> but he says this, listen, the picture I'm painting for you is a family, two and three. It doesn't really matter which two are for me, which three are against me. It does. There will be a split because people do not look at me the same. As you look at me, when you walk with Jesus, it will cause a change in you that causes conflict, uncomfortability in family members. And so we will we have to deal with which way do I go? Did Jesus go with his family when they came to get him? No, he stayed there. He told they left. And he kept going. His two brothers never believed in him while he was alive. 
There are times when separation must take precedent over relational loyalty. And I'm not saying, and, and, and hear me on this. There are people who say they're following Jesus when they're not following Jesus. Teresa and I, years ago, were amazed at this family. There was the father, and he loved the Lord. He was into the Lord. And, and the mother and three little kids they had. And one day he told her, I am going to leave you guys because God is calling me. And God is calling me to go over here and, and go in this other direction without the family. And nobody could talk him out of that, even showing him passages in Scripture that you have a responsibility. You're, ma you're married. You, you have responsibilities here. That's, you call that following God, and it's not following God. And nonetheless, he did that. So we can use the term following God, but it's just not wanting to deal with stuff. And all of us can deal with, uh, understand that. But there are times, I want to tell you guys another story about a, a young girl. It's a true story. You can actually look it up. Her name's Pet Perpetua. And this is way back in the 200s AD. So this is 200 years after Jesus. Roman government was in full, full uh, horrible governing of destroying Christianity. Christianity was outlawed. And that was during the time of feeding Christians to the lions, feeding them to the gladiators, making them fight to the death, um, dismembering them by different ways. I mean, it was, if you were convicted of being a Christian during this time by the Romans, you were going to be executed. This is a story about a 22-year-old noblewoman who lived in Carthage, North Africa, lived in the northern part, still under the control of the Romans. She was recently married and the mother to a nursing infant. Perpetua followed in her mother's footsteps and became a Christian in A.D. 203, despite major discouragement from her pagan father. When he begged her to abandon Christianity, she asked him if he could call a water jug by any other name than what it was. And when he said no, she told him, well, so too I cannot be called anything other than what I am, and I am a Christian. Her family tried desperately to dissuade her from Christianity, but she persisted. In desperation, her own father brought legal charges against her in the hope that the trial would shock her back into her senses. Even pleading with her eloquently during the trial, the guy became a witness in the trial against his daughter, but his goal was to get her to get out of that. He was hoping he could bring her back into her senses, even pleading with her eloquently during the trial, but she continued to profess Christianity and was convicted. The prison was hot and it was crowded, subjecting the believers to intense suffering, and the worst of which was Perpetua being separated from her newborn. Two deacons in her church were eventually able to come up with enough money to pay the guards to place the prisoners in a little bit better cell, and they came up with enough money so that she could bring in, they could bring in the baby so she could nurse her own child. They eventually were able to convince the warden and the guards to allow her to see her family. Remember, this is only a 22-year-old young lady. The prisoner's faith and the strength and courage then convinced the warden to allow the family to visit, and Perpetua could finally feed her child again. The testimony of Perpetua would eventually lead the warden to faith in Christ as well. He saw her faith and her gentleness and she saw the way she suffered, and it moved him. All the prisoners would get execution dates. They were all going down. So the execution of the prisoners was scheduled to take place during the military games celebrating the birthday of Emperor Severus, who was the emperor at the time. Finally, she was executed by being devoured by wild animals. 
they let them go into that and they starve these lions and they starve the bears and, and then they let someone go naked and uh, the animals chase them down and tear them apart. Perpetua's last recorded words were these. As she was getting ready to leave the cell for her turn to go, she said, you must all stand fast in the faith and love one another and do not be weakened by what we have to go through and what we have gone through. Her family deeply grieved her refusal to relent. Incidentally, Perpetua did not die in vain. Through, through her trial, her imprisonment, and finally her death, the Roman public came to see that Christianity was not some horrible threat. And Perpetua's death did much to end the practice of throwing Christians to the lions. Her testimony lived on. God allowed her stance to create a legacy. And that's what God does in our world when we choose to walk and choose God, even though sometimes there's great suffering involved. It doesn't matter what people say. There is something more going on. So my encouragement to you is to stay the course. Be a God pleaser rather than a people pleaser. Be a God pleaser rather than a you pleaser. Let God do the work he wants to do in you so he can do the work through you. And the trial you're in right now is a trial that is preparing you for something greater. It's preparing to increase your capacity to walk with God through any circumstance which has great influence on others. Sometimes our faith is the faith someone can hold on to in their trial because they go, wow, that person could endure this. Wow, that person went through this and, and they're still standing. I can do this. You know, recovery is all about that. All kinds of recovery is all about that. Having people farther down the road that can help us because they've been there, done that. Not because they have a theory about it. Not because they can talk about it. Because they've journeyed through it. And yet, they still stand to where this young girl preaches. Who knows the legacy of that guy that chose to be a minister rather than a doctor? Who knows how many souls that guy ministered to? How he was a doctor of the soul? Who knows? God does. Who knows what happens? I remember thinking, uh, you know, and we have our idea of how God's going to operate. I remember thinking, I wanted a, a, a big church. I remember being at Little His Place. I told you before where people say, you need to go to Orange, man. That's it's too far away. It's too landlocked. There's no, you know, it's nothing's going on there, yada, 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 yada. And I couldn't argue with them. And I agreed with them. I said, I absolutely, I agree with everything you're saying, but he won't let me go. <laughs> I want to. I want to, because I want to be like some of these big guys. And, uh, you know, and... and you know, it is what it is. And then finally one day God spoke to me. He said, hey, Joe, if I have you minister to these 20 people that show up, are you okay with that? Does that, does that meet your criteria? Are you all right with that? This is what I want you to do for the rest of your life. I go, the rest of my life? Can I die soon? <laughs> he goes, listen, if this is what I got for you, then are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? And man, that took me to a place inside me that said, wow. So it really is about following you. You follow, if I follow you and I go to the den of lions, is, am I okay with that? If I, if I follow you and I get to go to the third heaven like Paul, is, am I okay with that? What are you okay with and what are you not okay with? If you got to carry a burden of loneliness for a long time, are you okay with that? You got chronic illness you got to deal with for a long time? If, if that's where I'm leading you, are you okay with that? Can I use you in that? You're, you're, the, the stuff you've done in your past and you think you're too far gone and you messed up too long, are you okay if I, you know, wait to this part in your life to do any changes? 
You okay if you have to carry this stuff? You okay? And the answer needs to be, I'm okay with whatever you want to do, even if I have to, like Jesus, carry a burden that I don't want to carry, that I never asked for. What do I do with that? So this is the key, Perpetua. We don't know what all that took place in her life. We got a, a glimpse. In fact, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church have, a, hall, have a, a, a feast day for her. That's an influential part. 22 years old. Her life was short. And yet, she is honored. She is someone to look up to. You want to listen to the people. Listen to the people who have journeyed and stayed the course because they can help you with your trials and tribulations you're currently in. Experience counts for stuff in the kingdom of God. Experience counts. So what's the solution here? What's the answer? It says don't be a people pleaser. Don't be a people pleaser when it comes to God. Don't give up. Don't go sideways. God is still on the throne when it seems like he isn't. God is still in charge when he seems like he isn't. God is still doing a work when it seems like it's so slow. He's still doing it. In time, and especially with our families, you will influence them greatly. You will influence them greatly. How that all rolls out, we had the honor of leading trees, the, the guy that put me down, the guy that would say at Thanksgiving dinner, why are you guys praying to God? I'm the one that bought all this food. The guy that would make these things, he's the guy that trees got to lead to the Lord. And you know what he said? I want what you guys have. We didn't have his money. Well, we got some of it now, but... <laughs> Give honor where honor's due. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I got to, you know, I was the one that washed, I was the one that helped change his clothes when he couldn't control himself anymore, when he was going to the end. I, I got to do that. And I got to love him all the way through it, even though, you know, he is who he, he was who he was. And I know I'll see him again. And I know it's all good. And I know. I, I, why? Because God's word says that. And I believe God's word. That's what, I believe God's word more than anything. What I see, what I experience, what others say. And James and Jude, huh, Jesus' brothers, half-brothers, they got two books in the New Testament. They got saved. They, hey, that's a good thing. They didn't believe him while he was alive. He had to appear to them after he rose from the dead. That's crazy. I wonder what he said to them. Mm, voila. <laughs> anyway, Perpetua influenced a nation. He tells his disciples, listen, sometimes following me will cause division. And that's okay. That's okay. It's not personal. It's the way it is. They did it to me. They'll do it to you. And it's okay. Why? This gives you opportunity to love. Gives you an opportunity to continue to love those who hurt you. Those who disagree with you. It's okay. So, I want to be, and I want us to be like it says in Joshua when he was leading the Israelites into the land of milk and honey, and they were having a lot of problems with the difficulty of the journey. He said, if you guys want to go serve other gods, go, go. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For me and where I live, my house or my household, we will serve the Lord. And that's the key. I'm in it to win it. You guys are in it to win it. We will win it. We will win. We will win. But on the journey there, there'll be lots of stuff to deal with. Amen? Amen. Stay the course. All right, why don't we stand up? I'll, I'll not, I'm not going to lead you in a prayer today because I don't want you to say some things, then you walk out there and go, I didn't mean any half of that, what he said. 
So I'll pray, and if you agree at the end, well, you can just say amen. Amen? amen. All right, Lord Jesus, I just lift up my brothers and sisters right now to you, Lord. You know everything they're in. You know what they're about. You know what the, the especially in their families, God, you know. You know the, the, the division that can take place simply because they are following you, simply because they're not doing things they used to do. Father, some of, these, some of these precious children of yours have been with groups of people that they're having a hard time disconnecting with because they, they're being drawn back into stuff that is damaging. And they love these people, Lord. Give them the strength, God, to love from a distance. Father, some of us try to hammer our families into faith, Lord God. Help us, God, to love our families where they're at. To, to remove ourselves from toxicity, but to love them where they're at and to pray for them and to stand in the gap and to stay the course so that by our lives they will be influenced because they're certainly not going to open your word. So let our lives be the Bible they get to observe. Let our lives so mirror you that they will believe like the Romans did when they saw Perpetua, that, wow, this thing is real. This, it's not bad. It's good. Look at their lives. Look at how, she, how she's walked her walk. Lord, let that be our testimony in our generation. Bless your children with endurance, patience, and Lord, if we got to carry burdens like you did, then give us this, the great ability and strength and power to carry them well for as long as we have to carry them. I pray, God, that it'll be short. People got issues in here that they're dealing with, and it's very painful now. I pray that journey will be short. But if you choose to allow it to be longer, then God, give them the strength to endure well. So we thank you for that. Bless these precious people. And all those who agree, say amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a great day.